scratchy and soft. <laughs> oh, the quality has improved. The quality, yes. But for copyright infringement, it probably was better that it was scratchy and soft. <laughs> well, it's a good thing that you said that after we started recording, Anita. Okay. Um, so welcome, everyone. Uh, welcome to Office Hours with Dave and Anita. Um, we have a really great program today uh, with three uh, speakers working on uh, working in the area of climate change and adaptation to climate change. Uh, so my name is Dave Block. I'm chair of the Department of Viticulture and Knowledge and one of the hosts of the show, uh, Nita Oberholster. Well, I don't know, sitting over here on my screen, but I don't know where she is on your screen, uh, but she's over there. Um, and what I'd like to do first is to introduce our three speakers for today uh, and to welcome, welcome them to the show. So our first speaker is Professor Beth Forrestal. Uh, Beth joined our faculty in the Department of Viticulture and Analogy back last fall. Um, she has an undergraduate degree in biology from Cornell University. And after that, uh, worked in uh, various, I guess, careers you'd call them from uh, shipbuilding to working in restaurants from Maine to uh, Berkeley. That's pretty much coast to coast right there. Um, and she went back to school to get her PhD in ecology and evolutionary biology at Yale University, uh, followed by postdocs at Harvard. And then right before she joined us, postdoc at UC Davis. Um, she's worked uh, extensively in uh, evolutionary biology and understanding responses to climate change. And at UC Davis, she works um, in those areas, along with focusing on uh, dealing with heat spikes, which are becoming even uh, more and more uh, uh, present in viticulture in California and other places around the world. And that's one of the topics that she'll be focusing on today. Joining Beth today is Martina Galliano, who's a master's student in viticulture and knowledge, uh, originally from Mendoza, Argentina. Uh, um, and working with Beth for her master's degree in this area. So she'll be talking about her work. And also Lauren Parker, who's a USDA Climate Hub postdoc, um, working uh, uh, again in this area of uh, climate change and climate change adaptation. Um, Lauren has a bachelor's degree from Mount Holyoke and a master's degree in Oregon State and a PhD in, at, from the University of Idaho um, she's a geographer by training and has worked in applied climatology. So we're very happy to have all of them here uh, joining us. And the way this will work is I'm going to turn it over to Beth in a second to talk a little bit about her research and she'll have uh, Martina and Lauren uh, join her in talking about their research. And hopefully we'll have plenty of time to uh, field questions and have discussion after that um, or during if you have a burning question. For those of you who haven't been uh, with us in the past, you know you have several options for asking questions. Um, you can, if you open the participants panel at the bottom of your screen, there's a little blue hand that you can electronically raise and we'll, we can call on you. Um, otherwise, you feel free to uh, chat, type something in chat and we can relay it to the speakers or you can just unmute yourself and ask uh, if you'd like, you can do that too. And we'll try and keep track of that while the speakers are speaking because it's hard to do everything at once. So we'll let you guys know when there are questions from, from the audience. And so um, I, I wanna note that all these sessions have been recorded. They're all, they've all been posted on Aggie Video, which is the UC Davis uh, video repository and the Viticulture and Knowledge Extension channel. And so if you wanna go back and listen again, you're welcome to go back and listen to any of the sessions from, uh, from previous weeks. And so I think with that, I'm going to turn it over to Beth to um, introduce the topic and uh, and say some words about the research that she's that she's been working on. Thank you, Dave. Thank you all for coming today. It's great to be able to do this, even if remotely. Ideally, it would be in person, but it has been awesome for Dave and Anita to put this together and be able to talk to people that maybe wouldn't have otherwise been able to make it. Um, which I think has been one of the benefits of this unfortunate circumstance. So I'm gonna put this into 
slideshow. There we go. So as Dave mentioned, um, my newly formed lab works a lot on understanding the evolutionary and ecophysiological basis of climate change responses. Um, and a lot of what I focus on is understanding extreme responses to extreme events and heat in particular. And so I'm going to just talk to you briefly about what we're doing in the lab and how we're thinking about addressing climate change in viticulture, um, both on the short term and on the long term. Um, so this is, I'm going to go through this quickly, but I think we all know that there's been this rapid increase in mean temperatures and a lot of the actual literature in terms of adaptation strategies for viticulture has focused on changes in mean temperature. Um, but we've also seen and will continue to see actually greater increases in T max, so maximum daily temperatures. Um, and this is just a figure from a, actually a paper from 2010 that shows across climate stations in California, 130 of them, the mean T max. Beth, Beth oh. I'm sorry. So, yep. so your slides are not showing up. Oh, they aren't? Yeah. Just not on. So maybe. Maybe you need to like mirror. Maybe I have to press it. play and then let me press play and then share my. If, if, if you go to the, um, the yeah, go to the little screen at the bottom and click on that. I think you should be good. Once I press play. Uh, resume share. For some reason, it's telling We're me. Also we're also seeing it in like presenter view instead of in viewer, okay. viewer view. Yeah, Got it. Let me just fix this. Sorry about that. I'm not sure. It's saying when I share it that I have to. Let me try playing it first and then sharing. I think if you if you just do the normal share desktop, that seems to do okay, and then hit just the start slideshow, and I think you should be good. Okay. Yeah, I had tried to share a subset, but I don't think that worked. Can you see it now? Yep. Well, now you're seeing presenter view. And, and so go up up to the top of the screen and hit um, like mirror. Start the slideshow. And just did. And, and, then, then, and then there's a button at the top that says like mirror screens or something like that. Swap displays. Yeah, try that. Does that work? Yeah. That's Are it. You, okay. Sorry. This is, I actually don't usually use PowerPoint and I used PowerPoint today. So, no okay. Problem. Thanks for your patience. So I won't just talk into the, into the ether now. Now you have some visuals. Um, so as I was saying that a lot of the focus has been on mean climate change, um, but really we're having increases in extreme temperatures and especially nighttime extreme temperatures. So this is looking at weather stations across California and the change from 1950 of mean Tmax um, all the way up to 2010. Um, and even in recent times, you can see it's, it's becoming even more extreme if you look at the last five years and then there's this trend, even more extreme trend in nighttime, nighttime temperatures. Oh, you, can you see my cursor? No. Okay. Yes, we yes. can. Yes. So what I have started to focus on in terms of thinking about adaptation strategies is really thinking about these extreme temperatures and how they influence rates of development, um, physiological and biochemical responses. And if we think about it, what will happen in the future, um, projections for on the left hand side is number of days of three day increase in heat waves that are three days greater than 38 degrees Celsius um, or about 100 degrees Fahrenheit, which is one of the typical cutoffs as defined by CalADAPT in, in certain regions that we'll talk about going forward. Um, but you can see there's this really rapid increase in the number or a really significant increase in these number of heat waves up to, this is to 2100, um, or the mean between 2070 and 2090. And then additionally, one thing that's gonna become a real issue is that 
not only will we have these heat waves increasing, but we'll also have a really significant increase in um, atmospheric demand for water. So increases in vapor pressure deficit and thus um, increased need for water and water application because the atmosphere will be drawing water more quickly from the soil. So there'll be a really intense increase in, in irrigation. And that'll be coupled with reduction in um, the snow melt, which is really critical in feeding places like the San Joaquin Valley and places where heat will be really, really critical. So just to show you that in the context of a few regions, we work in Lodi in the Central Valley and this is showing you again, current 2050 and then 2099, how you see these increases in the Lodi AVA that are pretty significant. And this is again, this is just merely the days, number of days above 38C, but as you could imagine, most of these are during the growing season, during the warmest time of year. So it's a pretty dramatic increase where in some areas you get uh, up to 60 to 80 days, some of the important growing regions where you have these extreme temperatures. And similarly, even though Napa is not as extreme in a change, you still do see an increase from mostly zero currently, or having zero to five of these days, is that you're gonna have many more in the future. And so as far as what strategies we think about in terms of coping with that, the big project that I've started that Martina is doing her master's on is understanding how we can mitigate the effects of heat wave by manipulating irrigation. Um, there are other means to do so, but irrigation is one that we all have access to um, because we're ir largely irrigating in California. Um, another, and we'll address that in greater detail, so I won't go into that. I also am characterizing cultivar specific thermal tolerances and acclimation, and that's in common gardens um, at Davis currently. And then we also have an experimental manipulation of heat wave timing and intensity that's starting at UC Davis in an experimental vineyard. We planted it last year, and so it will go into treatment in a year and a half. Um, so those are thinking about short-term adaptive measures. What can we do now um, in terms of things like canopy manipulation, irrigation application during heat waves to mitigate stress and then not over water because we know deficit, deficit irrigation is critical as well in terms of having quality and the berry traits that we want and wine characteristics. And then the other piece of these long-term adaptive measures. Um, there are two projects that I have going on that are more focused on that in, ther in terms of thinking about what are strategies going forward in terms of what varieties you would want to plant and whether some of the most popular varieties such as Cabernet, um, how much diversity, climatic diversity and diversity we have in major growing regions such as Napa, where we do have quite a bit of diversity in soils, elevation, we have room much more so than has been shown in some past studies for adaptation and adapting new styles within Cabernet and having clonal diversity too, or embracing that. And so the first piece is advancing the Winkler Index. And this is something funded by um, funding the department to look at this by uh, Warren Winiarski, and it's in collaboration with Steve Mathiason um, and involves multiple members of the department. And then, and that's actually modeling the environmental parameters that are driving dairy chemical traits. Um, across different regions in Napa with specific focus on Cabernet and then to be extended to other varieties so we can build new models of where it's appropriate to plant varieties. And then the second is just thinking about cultivar and varietal selection in the future, not just what we use today, but um, what might be good future varieties and leveraging some of the diversity in Southern Italy or Spain or Portugal or regions that have climates uh, similar to what we'll see in the future. And the Rossi funds of the department have, have set forth some resources to start vineyards that are cultivar, randomized and replicated cultivar, um, cultivar vineyards, both in Oakville and in Davis. And it's nice because there have been, I mean, there are people who have set great, great precedent for this work, like Glenn McCordy, and then there's the Liberty Trials. Um, and that Kearney Agricultural Station, but we wanted to keep, there really isn't an active varietal trial currently and not one that's replicated and randomized and then also in multiple locations. 
and also focused on heat tolerant varieties and varieties in the future and have enough replication that we can do wine with it too. So it's going to be about 60 wine grape cultivars. And we're supposed to plant it this season, but there's of course some constraints right now, but the vineyards are being prepped currently. And there's also an international component where we're using the same rootstock, um, SO4, as a similar design and having some of the same clones as what's happening in Bordeaux and then Adelaide and Global Affairs is funding um, having some collective efforts to, to leverage the resources and see how these different varieties actually perform in different climates and under different conditions and soils. Um, and I should say too that one thing that I'm doing actively is asking, reaching out to growers and winemakers to see if there are specific clones or cultivars that are of interest to include in this. Um, and I will, I, I will probably send out an email or follow up, but if you are interested in contributing or having, giving some say in what that would be, I would love to hear from you. Um, so I'm gonna introduce Martina Galliano and she's gonna talk about the project we have in collaboration with Ian J. Gallo where we're looking at during heat waves, how we can mitigate um, damage, both reduction physiological performance at the vine level, and then also chemical downstream effects on berry biochemistry and wine. We won't present the wine data because we unfortunately couldn't do our sensory studies yet this year. Um, but this is just, it's a variable rate drip irrigation system. So we are able to manipulate irrigation only during heat waves. And this is a really critical piece. So this is the layout of the treatment. And we have a baseline treatment where we kept it at what would be deficit irrigation or 60% ET and had three replicates or four replicates, but measured from three. Um, and each of these, these are 30 by 30 meter pixels with 170 vines. These are the vines we sampled within them for physiology and berry biochemistry. Um, and so we have our baseline treatment where we maintain deficit irrigation during a heat wave, um, then two times that baseline amount and three times that baseline amount. Um, and it's, as I said, it's really critical to note, this is not manipulation during the entire field season. It's only the day prior during a heat wave as, and we define heat waves as three or more days above 38 degrees Celsius or 100 Fahrenheit. Um, and then we stopped application the day after. And so this is just showing you the actual results. And I'm gonna turn it over to Martina um, to share some of, a little bit of the physiology, but mostly the berry biochemistry from this study. Thank you, Beth. Um, well, um, thank you all for coming. And I'll just gonna show you some of the results that we got from this past season and where we saw the major differences in treatments. And in this graph, what we have here is the daily applied irrigation in gallons per acre. And as Beth mentioned, when we apply these irrigations, that was only during the heat wave periods. And during the 2019 season, we have two heat waves, one that happened just before operation and was at the end of July and a second heat wave that happened at, during mid-August and was post variation And on your right y-axis, you have the daily maximum temperature in Celsius, where you can see when we had more than three days above 38 Celsius in maximum temperatures. Oh, so this is looking at the STEM, uh, midday STEM water potential throughout the different sampling days that we carry out throughout the season. Uh, so we started sampling from early July to September. And here, what uh, is important to see is that during heat wave, we don't really have significant differences among humans. Um, and we do have a, a treatment effect post heat wave, where we have um, the baseline treatment actually has a lower stem water potential compared to other two treatments, but in general, these values of stem water potential post heat wave are less negative than any other days that we sample, even when we started sampling early on in July 12, July 1st, where we didn't have any heat wave. 
Uh, so we're having overall, these vines weren't really stressed throughout the season. That's where, where we are seeing so far, at least from a midday stem measurement. And then the major differences that we see in treatments uh, first was yield-wise, where we had a significant decrease in kilograms per vines and grams per cluster in the baseline treatment. And this was mainly related to a decrease in berry, in berry weight that we had after heat wave that was preparation, uh, where it seems that heat wave one had a, a significant effect, effect in actually stopping cell division in the baseline treatment, and we ended up having lighter berries and also smaller berries. And then for berry chemistry, uh, for bricks, pH, and TA, in general, we don't see really big differences at the beginning of sampling. And it's actually when heat wave two happens is that we're starting to see differences in treatment. And the baseline treatment here, you can see how it starts accumulating sugars faster after heat wave two, and it actually reaches maturity a week before the other two treatments, which we define in this study to be around 25 bricks. And for pH and TA, we have um, a similar trend. We start seeing differences during heat wave two. And again, the baseline is the one that is showing an important decrease in TA, which is coupled with an increase in pH. And this continues throughout the season. And then is heat, the, um, the 2x treatment is the one that ends up having like uh, a higher TA and um, a lower pH at the end of the, at the, at the harvest point, I'm sorry. <laughs> and now, yeah, moving on to the, um, now moving on to the, um, the phenolic part of it, we looked at skin phenolics and we mainly focus on anthocyanins and tannins. And for total anthocyanins, after heat wave two, there was an important degradation in the baseline treatment of anthocyanins while the 2X treatment seems to be the one that had the highest synthesis. And interestingly, is the 3X treatment the one that has a lower content compared to the 2X treatment? So here we start seeing some of the detrimental effects um, in some very quality traits from adding, resulting from adding too much water during these um, time periods. And these differences, they continue throughout ripening. And finally, for tannins, <clears throat> We saw differences from the very first sampling point at 50% aeration, uh, which uh, I guess we didn't mention, but we started sampling from 50% aeration to harvest. And again, the baseline treatment having a lower content compared to the other two treatments. Um, and these differences then suggest that whatever differences happening are happening in treatments are happening during tannin synthesis. So from flowering to aeration, and it's likely possible that heat wave one is playing a role in affecting tannin biosynthesis. And this year, uh, what we came up with is that for this season, we're gonna start sampling from pea size to um, harvest point to actually know more about what's happening um, during tannin synthesis and be able to know when these differences are actually happening and coming apart. And finally, some of the conclusions that we drew from this first year of the experiment. Uh, we saw that vines exposed to differential irrigation were able to recover after heat waves from physiological stress. And that the main influence that we had was on berry composition and yield, and where we saw negative effects from either underwatering or overwatering. And also we saw a higher evaporative cooling effect in vines that were exposed to higher irrigation, but really no differences between adding double the amount of water and or adding the tri triple the amount of water. Thanks, Martina. Yeah, so I think we we're quite surprised to find that at least from this, this initial season that we found a detrimental effect of applying too much water. And so really what we're trying to do next season is we're doing a lot more remote sensing and continuous sensing. We're doing transcriptomics as well and measuring a lot more parameters 
to understand what could be driving that. And this is an interesting year because we've already had a heat wave. So we've already sampled because it was 100 and I think it got up to 104 already. Um, and it was 100, over 100 for three days during flowering. So we'll see. We didn't see any physiological responses because there's ample water already, but it'll be interesting to see what happens downstream. And so with that, I'll let uh, Lauren finish up quickly and just sell sell this survey that we're doing <laughs> to understand current practices. Right, so as um, Beth mentioned, all of the various projects and all the pieces of them that you know are all related earlier, there's one small part um, wherein we're trying to better understand the types of irrigation practices that growers currently use when they're responding to heat extremes. And the, the hope is that this will help us inform how we frame any future research questions around um, potential effects of um, irrigation or the way we're designing experiments and that sort of thing uh, down the road. Um, and I want to just make a note that the survey questions, we would really love it. Um, we want to get as, as sort of a wide and representative cross-section of growers and types of operations, whether that's location or cultivar or size of operation across the state as we can. So um, please, if you're, if you're watching this now, <laughs> uh, take a moment, write down that URL um, and take the survey, send it to your friends. But I wanted to just um, make a note that we recognize that the, the survey questions um, and the response options are really painted with a broad brushstroke. And I want to take this opportunity to acknowledge that um, the realities of grower decision making around irrigation are more nuanced than can be captured in a 10 minute um, Google form survey. And so I just want to stress that the, the purpose of the survey is to provide a 30,000 foot view for us. Um, there is an option at the end to kind of provide any comments that you may have, and I would welcome those. Um, I spent some time designing the survey. I want to thank uh, Monica Cooper and Angie Perry. They both provided some uh, useful feedback on a, an early version, but um, I will readily admit that I am um, new to viticulture and to survey design. So um, this will probably not be the last of these surveys and we do hope to get a lot of information, a lot of feedback um, from growers and stakeholders. Um, so if you do have any um, comments or suggestions on how to improve any of our future surveys, um, that would be welcome as well. And you can leave those comments on the survey at the very end. And that, that's about it for the survey. Please take it. Well, thank you. Um, I think you probably, I, I saw Dave just put the survey URL in the chat box as well. Um, Perfect. Can probably, Beth, you can probably stop sharing your screen. Ha. Huh. So if anybody have questions, you can either raise your hand and we will try and see you electronically or really. Um, or you can chat, uh, put a question in the chat box because otherwise me and Dave is just going to ask all the questions because we never run out of questions. Um, but usually it works. If I start off with a question, so then somebody usually think about one. So I'm going to start off with to anybody, but I'll address it to Beth. So thinking about this research, how do you think the results from this trial will be able, will enable you to develop more general guidelines for people to say, okay, this is the potential irrigation management that you can do during a heat wave to minimize impact? So I think from the, the results from last year, that was a preliminary look into what was possible. And the idea this year is to actually be exploring, and I should, say, I should have said this earlier on, this is also in collaboration with Andrew McElrone and who's developed some of the surface renewal techniques and done a lot of work on this and now remote sensing. And so the idea is to actually be able to take this and say, what is the, the best plant indicator for when you're reaching a level where it might be useful to irrigate and then using that and that could be so there there's a group in Adelaide um, that we're starting to work with that uses actually believes to model conductance might be a more valuable indicator because this was also surprising to us too that we didn't find that midday stem water potential would have necessarily guided us in a particularly meaningful way and even in speaking with um, 
people at Gallo, I think, I think that there, there is a need to want to find what the best indicators are. And that's what we're trying to do with having this continuous sensing is get a better idea of no matter what vineyard you're in. And granted, we're also extending this to other varieties too. Like the experimental work um, will be, will also include Chardonnay um, and a few other varieties. And then we're monitoring responses to heat waves in a block in Davis so that we can understand Obviously, this isn't going to be a one size fits all as these cultivars vary significantly. But if you can get an idea, also rootstock is going to play. But if you can get an idea of what the response is at the scion level, are there indicators that we can use to say, hey, you've hit, you've hit this point or we know what the um, plant water status is based on X, Y, and Z or temperature is, you really want to apply some water to get your temperature down or get something apply some and there are other there are other things to do too like some people in Napa mist and there's shade structures you can put up but I think in many areas it's probably impractical to do that at a large scale and especially areas where a vast amount of production is occurring to be able to do those kinds of practices although they do in some places. So Beth there's a, a question in the chat um, can you they, they wanted to know if they could see the leaf water potential graph again. Yep. And then there's a, there's another question after that, but. Okay. I'm gonna get it right this time. <laughs> there you go. And this is stem water potential, not leaf water potential. I think that was it. I think they just wanted to see it. I don't know if you have any more questions on that uh, on that graph, but if you do, you can uh, just uh, write them into chat or or, uh, or unmute and ask. Um, Okay, this is a, another question for Beth. Uh, did you look at the impact of light on the fruit chemistry or only water? Um, we looked at the impact of, so we didn't present this. We, I'm actually gonna let Martina answer this. I don't know why I'm, I'm monopolizing the, <laughs> the stage. Uh, well, I, and I think that we didn't look at, um, we only work with water, so we didn't look at either like light influence on the production of these secondary metabolites, uh, but this is something that we are planning to do next season. So we are putting um, thermocouple sensors and we're putting PAR sensors at the cluster level to be able to know how other environmental ha factors can uh, be influencing the production of these metabolites, which uh, we think it could be also influencing um, some of these um, to say we'll provide more information about what's going on at the canopy level. And we're also working with, so one thing that we're doing is we're working with Brian Bailey, who does a lot of um, modeling. He's an engineer um, by training and does a lot of modeling of canopy structure and responses. And he has built some models modeling um, berry temperature. And so we're actually using his setup to be able to model berry temperature through the season and different phenophases. And that may be a decent predictor variable too, if we have continuous um, berry temperature models. And we're using thermo thermocouples for that too. So we are incorporating other aspects. And the canopies here, this is a, this is a very, this is a mechanized vineyard and the canopies, the fruit is almost completely shaded in this vineyard. So it's not a lot of, it's a high wire um, modified sprawl. Um, system and so there isn't a lot of light penetration. So again, and, and relating back to what Anita said is, is I think you would want to have a different set of characteristics if you're using a traditional VSP or if you had a lot more light exposure, it would make a big difference. Um, and whether you'd want to have modified VSP and have shading. And, and I just might add that Brian Bailey is a professor of um, here at UC Davis in the Plant Sciences Department. Oh yeah, thank you, Dave. Sure. 
I'm not sure if everybody knew that, so yeah. I forget. Yeah. <laughs> That's a good. So I have a follow-up question about uh, berry chemistry. So in the past season, you had two heat waves, one just prior to Verizon, if I remember correctly, and one in August, right? Um, so what do you think about the timing of the heat waves? I mean, that's pretty typical, but it could vary somewhat. Do you think there would be a large influence due to timing of the heat wave on the impact on berry chemistry? That's a great question, Anita. And I think uh, one of the great things that we, uh, and that we were lucky is that we had a heat wave that was preparation and a postpiration heat wave. So we were able to like, see these differences. And I think that first for the postpiration heat wave, the effects that you see are are easier to see. Like you see like responses like in bricks, in pH, in TA, in your color, which are important traits at the time of when you define maturity. But we actually saw that the pre-heat wave um, or the preparation heat wave had a lot of effects, like not only the um, on tannins as we saw in the previous graph, but also uh, and we didn't show these results, but we saw that it actually delayed the start of anthocyanin synthesis in the baseline treatment. And there have been a couple of studies like looking at a thermal decoupling happening between anthocyanins and bricks. Uh, and we actually saw that happening, like a delay in synthesis when they started the devices that were under higher thermal stress and Water stress is starting synthesizing anthocyanins at a higher breaks. And also we saw some changes in, we, we look at monomeric anthocyanins and also saw changes in hydroxylation, um, as well as a decrease in, in, in berry weight uh, that seems to be really affecting berry cell division at that stage. So maybe we're not paying that much, much attention or we consider post heat waves of post variation heat waves to be uh, really like uh, having a, a critical impact, but I think that we should be starting paying attention a lot to pre variation heat waves too. So, and I hope I didn't miss this. Follow up question. Mm -hmm. um, so, thinking about light, um, you also may, uh, you mentioned that there is the potential for irrigation due to evaporation to actually cool down the temperatures in the canopy a little bit as well. Did you uh, measure temperatures? Because I mean, specifically things like anthocyanins are very sensitive to um, specifically night temperatures, but also day temperatures during synthesis. Yeah, we, what we did, we measured um, leaf temperatures. We did not measure fruit temperature, but we will this year. And we saw differences in at least at the leaf level um, we did see differences in treatments, uh, especially when we compared the baseline with the 2X and the 3X. The 2X and the 3X actually, we, we got this evaporative cooling um, from the canopy. And I think also the trolley system that we, ha that we have in this uh, vineyard also helped not only from like to reach higher uh, transpiration from the leaves, but also helping with the evaporation coming from the ground, like getting this cooling effect. But this year we'll monitor like with thermocouples, so we have recordings from pretty much like uh, all like night and day in the fruit zone. And I'll just There's always more to measure, right? <laughs> I'm sorry. There's always more to measure. Yeah, always. <laughs> um, can you see? Am I sharing the right screen? Can you see the temperature responses? No. No. This is like so. I don't know why it keeps doing this. Never mind. There are temperatures. <laughs> I'm just gonna let it go. There are, there are, we did, there are significant cooling responses. And as Martina mentioned too, it had, um, it, if you a applied that really excessive amount of water, although I wouldn't say it's excessive because actually that was what would have been applied had we not been involved. That actually was the three times was what was applied during heat waves based on the winemakers and the growers decision. So some people have said, you know, this is crazy. Why would you apply 21 hours of water um, through these heat waves? But I actually think that that's not uncommon to do that. And I think it depends on what your baseline irrigation style is too. Are you watering every two weeks or are you watering multiple times a week? 
but we saw that there is a limited returns as far as you get to a point where you're not cooling the canopy anymore, but you do see an, an effect on, on um, plant performance. And we're looking at carryover effects too, to see if um, source sink dynamics are affected. It didn't influence timing of, uh, of bud burst at all, our last year's treatment, but it'll be interesting to see if it has any yield effects. So we have that, the carryover effects nested within, within the current treatment. So I have a, a question from chat. Um, are the research locations in Australia similar to Napa and Lodi in climate, similar rain patterns? What's to be learned from the Australian sites that will be able that we will be able to use here on the West Coast? So similar, so it's, it's a Mediterranean ecosystem. Um, it is similar in that it's an area where they're not receiving summer rains, so it's all irrigated. Um, they haven't chosen the site yet, but this is, it, it has analogous, analogous um, climatic parameters, except one thing that is, I think really interesting about it and how we can glean information from other sites internationally is that they're ahead of us in terms of climate change as far as heat extremes. So the region where it would be is actually has typically um, more extreme temperatures more frequently than we do in some of the areas here. So, and similarly, they also are going to have issues like the Central Coast, they already do about salt in regards to salt tolerance and water availability. So it's actually a really, I think, valuable thing to be looking to other collaborators and international collaborations. And Australia, I think, is a really natural one um, to do so. And similarly with like the smoke team and Anita's work as well. So I think that it can actually help guide us because they might be able to see things that happen under even more extreme conditions than we may have in areas here um, that will help us understand what we should think about in the future. And I, and I would point out, even if the climates were identical, which they're not, um, it, it would help us to be getting two seasons worth of data a year and have to have the chance of getting heat waves happen at different times and so forth, since you can't really control that as much. So, so I think that's an advantage as well. Um, I, I have another uh, question in chat. Um, during heat waves, do you have any thoughts about the value of the short drink versus the long drink application of irrigation? Short drink being how long, I guess it depends on what you consider a short drink versus a long drink. I do think that it depends on the time of year. So for example, we saw no, if you already have water in the water table and you know your soils well, I don't think you, this isn't something that, I, this is a hypothesis I have that I wanna test experimentally, but that actually you can benefit earlier on via acclimation. And there's some of this research out there in controlled settings that acclimation is actually a really critical feature to being able to cope with heat waves. So you build up these radicals and these solutes and this, um, the basis for having a response, a protective response to heat waves, if you have one early on in the season, that it actually can facilitate better photo protection later or heat protection later. And so I, I think early on in the season, I think it, you, it might not be something like shading might be more effective for thinking about flower, flower development. Um, I know you need light in there too, but I do think that not having too much water at that point, whereas when you're in deficit irrigation, it's probably not a bad idea to do these longer periods of irrigation. And I know that that these more cyclical periods of irrigation, because I know that in some, that some growers, some in the central coast, and I know Angie, does this too, Jay Laura does this, is they do less frequent irrigating and they're for longer periods. And that there's some evidence that that then results in having deeper rooting, which means greater water access. Um, but it's really soil dependent, but I would think that, I, I do think there's the ability to have acclimation and that um, being really nervous about it early in the season, you might be better off and it's yet to be seen. Um, and we even what the mechanisms are, mechanisms are that you wouldn't want to be applying tons of water and have that longer period early in the season. 
But I think it's still out for debate. How is it that you determined uh, 38C as the uh, definition of heat wave? So that's a good question. So in Lodi, so a heat wave, actually, Lauren, I want you, this should be, you should answer this. Sure, so there are a, a lot of different ways in the sort of climate literature that we define heat waves. It can be anything from some threshold temperature or some percent of, or some, some temperature that's relative to normal, right? Like 38 C in, um, I don't know, in some coastal location is going to sort of feel much hotter than 38 C in Bakersfield, right? And then there are um, definitions around um, the impacts, so whether that's human health or in this case, um, the physiological uh, responses of, of um, well, that's kind of, that's kind of where I was coming from, because I remember years ago, and I mean like in 25 years ago or so, Erlen Happ from Australia, who was a grower, not, not, a, not a researcher, he was a grower, he came up with what I think he called uh, heat units. And the premise that he developed, which was, which was intuitive and it was logical, was that for secondary plant metabolites, most of the enzymes that control their production at the latter part of the season uh, operate around 22 degrees C. And he developed a, uh, an algorithm whereby he would measure his canopy temperature and record its ele uh, elevation or, or reduction away from 22 C as a way of defining whether or not there was a, uh, uh, which climate should have which cultivars and the effect on, um, on various uh, uh, secondary metabolites. <clears throat> so I, I guess the point is that you can get some, some significant changes lower than you, 38 uh, C. And that was the basis of my question. Sure. You. So um, there, there are a few reasons that we kind of came to 38C. One is that across um, not necessarily viticulture specific literature, but across sort of like agroclimatic literature, anywhere from 35 to 40C is usually some cap for everything from accumulating growing degree days to really um, stressing plants to the point that, you know, they're conking out. Um, the other thing too is that when we're thinking about changes from a climatological perspective, um, CalAdapt, uh, which is a, it's, it's like UC Berkeley and I want to say Scripps and some other state institutions came up with 38C as a, um, as a, one of their um, sort of threshold temperatures used to define um, heat extremes. I think at the end of the day, you could um, come up with some definition for heat extremes that would be a different temperature value. And one of the things that we would really like to identify with this work too, that Beth mentioned earlier, is really what are the heat tolerances for mm -hmm. different cultivars. And so then yeah. I think once we get to that point, then we can go back and say, all right, well, let's like take a look at some of our earlier work and say like, now let's apply a different threshold, right? To some of this earlier work that's cultivar specific and how does that change uh, some of our results? So I don't know if that quite answered your question, but. Yeah, Beth is right. looking as though I have said I have <laughs> misspoken. So. Not at all. <laughs> I know this the danger. I should have a mask on. Then no one can. Although I guess your eyes. Are, no, your side eye is going to give you away. I know it's time. the side eye. Um, you just have to I, lean backwards. Yeah, and, and your head will disappear into the vineyard. I know. So I, I read his work, his work from Australia. It's actually phenomenal. I think it's really it was ahead of its time in terms of thinking about these things and probably worthwhile. Yes, very much so. Yeah, and I think also for what he did, I mean, he published white papers and they're amazing um, and really worthwhile for thinking about um, 
phenological models and, and how heat affects different cultivars. The one thing too that I think to remember as far as thinking 38 is very high is that's air temperature. And so we're basing it on forecasts of air temperature. And so actually within, and even leaf, and we're also our leaf temperatures, what we're looking at is leaves that are in full sun. If you get into the, and this will change a lot, if you get into the canopy, especially when the fruit's shaded, and if you have cooling, you're gonna have a dramatic reduction in the actual temperature of what the berries are and what the fruit's experiencing. And that can be contingent on so many things. And that's one thing that the, the Macaron Lab and others are working on. Um, and I think Khan has some work on it, is actually understanding what could be the best metrics that aren't air temperature um, and actually looking at um, a canopy temperatures and thermal, thermal imagery to be able to use that as a meaningful way to actually assess what tolerances are beyond air temperature because that can be so variable, even variable within the, the range of the canopy. So, and then also to a heat, as far as the acclimation, thinking about defining a heat wave, we would define a heat wave differently for a different region based on the notion that if you have what your baseline temperatures have been historically, we think about it as you being outside an extreme. So, you know, there might be some areas where that temperature is, is more common. And so you would have higher, a definition that might be different depending on what region you're in. And if you're in a Northern region, this, or a region where you never hit these temperatures and you have different cultivars, right. then you would define a heat wave differently too. So if I could break in for a second, we, we have about six minutes left and I just want to uh, put in a sh short plug for next week's show. So on June 16th at two o'clock, same, same time, same place, um, our next program will be focused on phenolic extraction and reactions and reactivity of phenolics. Um, and so there will be various uh, faculty members and researchers there to talk about that. I think I'll be there. Anita will be there. I think we'll have a couple more people who will, will show up to, uh, for that discussion. So I'll be heading back towards the winemaking side of things. So that'll be next week, again, June 16th at 2 o'clock. Um, so there, let's see. I guess there was a question in chat that uh, Beth has answered in chat. Uh, I don't I've know answered. if you want I'm to just, say anything I'm more about that. Now. Was there anything more you wanted to say about your your plans uh, on the winemaking side? Yeah, so unfortunately, as many of us have been affected, I, we can't do the sun. We were supposed to do the sensory study in April. And of course, that is not of the phase of even ramp up in the near future that I foresee happening. So the wine is sitting there. And it's been analyzed after bottling once, but we will reanalyze it when the sensory study can happen. Um, but it's a little bit of a bummer because then it's harder to compare years if we do it at different time points. So we will do the sensory study when we can, or maybe use a different technique that will make it so there's less potential contact. And so we'll see, it's, it's unfortunate, but we did taste the wines and they seem different. They look different. So that's my, my very cursory, unscientific means of telling you I think there are wine different. And the wine chemistry, I mean, Martina's analyzing the wine chemistry data too. So we have that. It's just a bummer to not go all the way at this point. So I have a quick question. What about the impact of rootstock on, you know, how vines handle heat waves? And I know you said they're still planting the vineyards in, in, in Adelaide. Are they planning to use the same rootstock or not? Yes, everybody's using the same rootstock. But so what rootstock are you using and what do you think is potentially the impact of other rootstocks? I mean, we're using SO4 because that's what Bordeaux has used and they have a long-term trial. Not to say that would be this, what you would necessarily select for places, but we made the decision to do that. Um, really, I don't know, there's so much site effect that really how much does it matter to, do you choose the rootstock that would be most appropriate or do you choose the same rootstock? I don't think we have, there, there are some notions of what influence rootstocks may have mostly but it's mostly about water right and so 
but like talking to the folks in Adelaide, they are starting to do some work on the effects of how rootstock, regardless of water status, can confer, confer heat tolerance. And so there, there's some preliminary work on that, I think. I haven't seen anything published, but I don't think we really know. Okay, because there's a question in, in, um, in the chat about, is anybody going back to St. George? Um, they use it pretty widely in Australia still. Mm. I mean, one of their trials is on St. George. I'm gonna say probably not. Maybe we'll breed better rootstocks in lieu of going back to St. George, but. Um, the St. George champion on this call just got real pissed off at you there, Beth. I, I mean, I'm not, I'm not. <laughs> opposed to St. George and I mean I'm sure Andy Walker would have his own thoughts as well um but yeah I, I don't know I don't know if that is I don't know how much of a fact it's really hard to tease apart the influence of water and drought being able to tolerate drought and being able to confer heat tolerance. And that's the one thing that I think is gonna be a real challenge. If you have something that's deeper rooting and then you, you're like, oh, look, it's able to tolerate drought, but it's just accessing water better. Or even your irrigation strategies, however you irrigate, leads to deeper rooting or cover cropping or other strategies. So that's one thing is it's hard because to do a field-based trial and actually be assessing that, you'd have to have a lot of information about what the roots were actually doing, I think, to assess that. And I think actually doing it at a molecular level would be valuable as well, but. So Dave, we can ask a quick, because I, this is a really, oh, there's one in chat. Rather ask the question in chat. Yeah, so just bef before we end, I just want to actually acknowledge um, the person producing these shows and getting our speakers and so forth, that's Karen Block. So I'd like to uh, acknowledge that. Um, she's popping in and out her picture there. She's actually sitting right across the table from me here. So it's easy to remember that I need to acknowledge her. Um, so there, there is a, uh, there is a uh, question in the chat is artificial intelligence used for irrigation. And I know we, we talked a little bit about that. Um, when Mason was, was on the show, uh, a couple weeks ago, but I don't know if Beth, you want to talk about that at all. Um, I have not for grapevine seen, I mean, there, there are you, so someone, someone like Thule is using machine learning for some of their modeling. Um, I know they're doing that now. So they're looking at what um, information they have and they're using this based on surface renewal and ET estimates um, with stations in your vineyard. Many of you use them. And they also now have that you can take a picture which estimates water potentials just based on a picture with your phone. So there is no question that some of these are using that. Um, but a lot of that's black boxy and AI is sort of a catch all term in a way. And so I think that, but I think there's no question that that will be the future in many ways. And there are people in our department actively working on that and could speak to the actual techniques that they're using. I mean, I'm Mason, I'm working with to actually predict phenological advancement and he's working with Dave on the irrigation piece. So there's no, it's, it's in, it's in practice, but not, I don't, wouldn't say widely. Would you, I mean, Dave can speak to that. Better. So, I mean, I, I think that, I think there's a, like Beth was saying, I think there's a lot of opportunity there from everything from converting images to actions to, I think one of the big things that we can use it for is to um, use it as a soft sensor, basically taking lots of information and have it correlate with uh, with an action or, or or response of a plant that would lead to an action. So I think that that's that's very doable. We did some work on that years with artificial intelligence years ago, um, doing things like that and doing some now in other fields related to uh, viticulture and analogy. So I, I think there's a lot of opportunity there. Um, and, you know, with people like Mason joining the faculty member and being able to work with uh, Beth and, uh, and Megan Bartlett, one of our other new faculty members, I think 
there's a huge opportunity there. I do think that using things like artificial intelligence is, it should, should never be a replacement for understanding the basics, the fundamental mechanisms underlying what we see. So I think doing both in parallel is probably the best opportunity because when you have more information about what's going on from, uh, you know, from basic biology and physics and chemistry, it's going to inform the modeling uh, and make your modeling much better. So I think go going forward in both is, is probably a big opportunity. So I know it's, it's 3.02, uh, so we're two minutes past when we were supposed to stop. So maybe I'll turn it over to Anita to uh, close the show for today. Well, that's a surprise. Well, thank you for everybody for joining us. Thank you for the speakers, Martina, Lauren, Beth. It was really, really interesting. Um, please join us again next week for phenolic uh, extractability and reactivity. And the week after that, we're going to talk about smoke exposure, the impact of smoke exposure on grape and wines. Um, have a good week. Keep safe. We'll see you next week. Thank you, Anita. Thank you, Dave. Thank you, Karen. Bye. Bye.